several years ago when I was driving a school bus in Texas. Margaret was a fellow bus driver I'd never really noticed before until I assisted her on a route. You might remember I had a brain deal that went on and they, uh, they didn't let me drive for a while, but they graciously kept me on and, and let me assist. It was safer that way. And I discovered as we got talking on the route that she was a woman of deep faith, but also a woman of deep pain and a deep desire to live a life lived for more. A desire, I think, that is common to most of us. Turns out that seven years ago, at now nine years ago, her adult son had been killed in a freak car accident and he left behind a wife and two young kids. Her husband left her because he was mad at God and when people are mad at God, they take it out on everyone around him. It's kind of like a bomb going off. It's sad to see. On the other hand, she found her faith strengthened. Isn't it, isn't it kind of weird how the same catastrophe can hit people and one person says, God, I hate you, and another person says, God, I can't do it without you. That's what happened to Margaret. She had nowhere else to turn for help. She had nowhere else to make sense of her tragedy. This thing's got to go. I will, I will kill it. She had nowhere else to go. She was regularly attending an evangelical church, but she was living with a boyfriend. And so she had this disconnect going on. She wanted God, but she needed this guy, and she knew that it wasn't right. It wasn't pleasing to God. The boyfriend had no interest in the things of God, and ladies, they rarely will walk out now. She knew she needed to make some major life changes to get her life back on track. And to look at her, where is she? Oh, thank you. She looks so normal, so happy. Who would guess that she was carrying such pain? People like Margaret are easy to miss, to overlook, to ignore. People like Margaret are easy to make assumptions about. Bring that up, please. I want to talk this morning about sitters at the well. People who are easy to overlook, ignore, make assumptions about. Jesus' own disciples we call them saints, and when we paint pictures of them, we put halos over their head. Jesus' own disciples missed the Margarets. But Jesus didn't. Jesus had a knack for spotting the sinners at the well. The people who maybe looked like they had it all together, but deep down inside... They were very, very broken. And we would do well to learn that, that habit from him. John chapter 4. I'm just going to race through this very familiar passage, but maybe you haven't heard it before, so I'll, I'll read the whole thing. It's one of my favorites. Beginning of verse 1, the Pharisees, those are the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the, what I call the religious mucky yucks. They were so proud of how holy they were. They opposed Jesus at every turn. The Pharisees heard Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. This would be John the Baptist, who was a forerunner to announce the coming of Jesus. Spent his ministry out in the desert, wearing really weird clothes. They heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. And when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which I think would be around noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, "'Will you give me a drink?' 
Parenthetically, John writes, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because Jews do not associate with Samaritans. The same way we have racial differences between people today or different communities don't interact with people of other communities. This is what it was back then. It was racism. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God... And who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And so the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. It's a deep well. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water... I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't have to get thirsty and keep coming back here to draw water. She's not quite on a spiritual wavelength yet, but Jesus is getting there. And he gets there by going right to the heart of her emotional pain. Go call your husband and come back. I envision a long silence. He's put his finger on the big ouch. And she's thinking... Her mind is going a mile a minute. What do I say? How do I handle this? And she decides to be honest with the Savior that she does not yet recognize as the Savior, which is always a good move. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. She's got to be going, whoa, you have blown my mind. Sir, the woman said, deciding to change the subject. Getting a little too close to home. I can see you're a prophet. A little flattery going on. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place we must worship is Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We Jews, we worship what we do know. Salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. In other words... Pleasing God is not a matter of worshiping in a particular building or a particular geographical location. Worshiping God is a matter of the heart and your relationship with God and truth. Very important to focus on the truth end of it as well. It's not just being spiritual. There's truth involved. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship. Again, he says, in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, well, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. I wonder when she entered glory, if she and Jesus had a good chuckle. <laughs> Remember that time when you said Messiah was coming and then you realized he was sitting right in front of you? Wasn't that a who? And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared... You're looking at him. I who speak to you am he. And just then, the saints with the halos over their heads returned from Burger King, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman, which culturally you didn't do back then. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? And then leaving her water jar, which is very significant, and you know why. What did it mean? She was coming back. 
She went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and they made their way toward him. Let's pray. Father God, your church needs to relearn this lesson over and over and over and over because we get all hung up on the religious aspect of Christianity and we think that worship is here or worship is there and it looks like this and it looks like that and it is about people far from you coming to the realization that you are the living water that they have been digging their own wells for and failing miserably their entire lives and you offer it freely. I pray that your church would have your eyes to see the sitters at the well all around us and that there would be water jars left all over Astoria as men and women far from you find their closest friends and neighbors and say, come see a man. Could this be the Christ? In his name we pray. Ken Smith saw the sitter at the well. Rosaria Butterfield was a tenured lesbian professor at Syracuse University in New York. She lectured on queer theory, which was the actual name of the course. And she was not surprisingly hostile towards Christianity and hostile towards the Bible. She had written an article slamming promise keepers, which you remember several decades ago was a huge Christian men's discipleship gathering. They would meet in stadiums and have huge events. And she had written an article slamming it. And he replied to her article as a Presbyterian pastor, and she didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't hate mail. It wasn't fan mail, but it was questions that no one had ever asked her. And then he invited her into a conversation, and she called him back for research because she wanted to do another hit piece on Christianity. And thought, all right, I got this joker out there. Let's... Let's see if I can milk him and get some good inside stuff to slam Christianity. She was writing a book on the religious right. And as a journalist of integrity, as a scholar of integrity, she realized I need to actually read the Bible if I'm going to write against it. So she read her Bible as a primary resource. And surprisingly, as a result of that and her relationship with this Presbyterian pastor, she became a follower of Jesus Christ. She says what Ken did right that moved her towards Christianity, and these are things that we need to learn from deeply, especially because I think culturally the situation has become much more hostile in the intervening decades. He showed her the nature of the Bible as a library. The Bible is not just a book. The Bible is a library of many different types of books. Had she ever considered that the Bible consists of every genre she had taught from? So from an academic, intellectual point of view, she was intrigued that, ooh, I never considered that. He asked her about her well-being. How are you doing? Instead of calling her names and walking around her school with a picket sign, he cared about her. He asked what was her opinion on his opinion. Boy, how often do we see that today? We just want to push our perspective. Once in a while, it's wise to sit back and say, well, what do you think about what I just said? She was intrigued by his graciousness. She was impressed that he had no air conditioning because she assumed evangelicals were entitled to have a hateful and violent dominion over the earth and they were unhelpful and unkind and he chose to live without air conditioning. She was impressed by that. That will never happen in our household. I'm sorry, I can be gracious and I can ask questions. I'm not getting rid of my AC. His home and his culture didn't seem so very different from hers. She was totally impressed. He had her over for dinner, and she was totally impressed with his prayer. I'm going to talk a little bit later about the power of praying. It was personal. It was intimate. It was new to her. The only prayers she had known were the recited, rote prayers that we can just spit out without thinking. 
She was impressed that he did not share the gospel. He did not invite her to church at first. He let the relationship build. I was talking to someone just this morning. Quite often, people need to feel that they belong before they will believe. And that's what we get to do. Someone was telling me the other day that the hardest part about sharing their faith was, was you got to know the Bible. And then what if they ask me a question that I don't know? And then you feel stupid and you feel like you blew it. I'm like, no, no, no. You're putting the cart before the horse. Sharing your faith in evangelism is super duper easy. All you have to do is care about people. Just build that relationship and you'll go far. And she writes, they knew they needed to bring the church to me that I would never go to church. And that's what we get to do. That's what I've been trying to say for two and a half years. We get to take the church to the people. Today, Rosaria Butterfield is a Christian author. She's a mom. She's a housewife. She's a pastor's wife. All because a Christ follower saw her sitting at the well and treated her as if she had great value. They're all around you. I said this two and a half years ago. I will never stop saying this. Do you see them? Jesus saw them. He saw people with messed up lives, not as objects of disgust or worthy of picketing or targets of God's holy wrath. He saw them as people in needs of God's grace and in need of God's truth. Truth does not get thrown out the window here. We love people, but we also balance it with the truth of what God says life is about and who he's about. And like the woman at the well in John 4, Jesus asked her for a drink. She's surprised because Jews and Samaritans hate each other. They get into this bizarre conversation. She becomes convinced he's a prophet, which makes her uncomfortable because she's lived a morally messed up life. He knows all about it. Eventually, she leaves and she returns with the whole town to hear Jesus and this messed up outcast woman becomes one of the very first evangelists in the Gospels. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? The first evangelist, the first, piece, the first person to bring people to Jesus in the New Testament was a messed up woman. They're all around you. Do you see them? Today, I want you to see them. Kim spotted one years ago the story of Tina. We had her name wrong for the first six months that we knew her. She was a neighbor. We called her Tina. She's like, why are you calling me Tina? My name's Lynn, but now she's Tina Lynn. She was our neighbor in our townhouses back in Maryland. She had four kids. She was loud. She was foul mouthed. She was an ex-con. I'm sorry. Sorry. Formerly incarcerated. Got to get that right. She was sexually broken. She'd been a lesbian as well at one point in her life. When she came over to visit with my wife, the neighbor ladies wouldn't come over. And we're not going over there if Lynn's there. So what turned her around? Kindness. You've got people in your life that are so far away from God and you want to argue with them, you want to preach at them, that's real effective. You want to lecture them, that works. Mm -hmm. Kindness. Kim baked with her children, brought them over, taught them how to do cakes, how to bake. She invited Lynn to the porch swing. We had a swing underneath our back deck and she said, come over, let's just sit and talk. They would just sit there and talk. Kim made the decision to deliberately ignore her ugly side. That's the same reason she chose me, I think, to be her husband. Eventually, we invited them to a church movie night. We showed movies, invited the kids, made popcorn. It was a mess. The floor was a wreck. It was horrible to clean up. We had spilled stuff everywhere. But who cares? It's just a building. They came to movie night. They were completely accepted by the church family. They're all dark black. The rest of our church was white, white. No one cared. They were people. And we loved them. And eventually she was baptized. She would keep talking about, I want to get my date. I want to get my date. 
And by date, she meant the date of my baptism because she was impressed that mine was 4679. And she wanted that date. And she eventually got her date. And then her world fell apart as her husband left her, as he was not in favor of this new religious move. And the courts completely messed with her, and she lost custody of her kids, and she moved out of state. She was forced to pay child support. It was a horrible situation. We've never witnessed anything like it before or since. And even today, from a long distance, she and Kim still talk on Facebook, and she's walking with Jesus, and life has gone a radically different way. But when your eyes are open to them, you see them everywhere, don't you? It's even in the movies. I, I love bringing movies in. I'm not going to show a clip, but uh, one of my favorite movies is The Way back in 2011 uh, with Martin Sheen, uh, Emilio Estevez. Uh, this is a doctor who's estranged from his disappointing son, and he walks the way of St. James to honor his son who had died at the beginning of the trek. This is the couple hundred mile journey from France to Spain. Some of you may have done that or intend to do that. And as I'm watching this movie about this guy walking the trip that his son would never get to walk because he died, it hit me. Every person you meet is on a pilgrimage. Everyone you meet is coming from somewhere and they're going to somewhere. Every person you meet has a story. Every person you lock eyes with at the gas station, at the restaurant, at work, in the office, at the plant. Everyone has a burden. Everyone is suffering some deep emotional loss. They've got pain. They've got doubt. They've got hurt. They've got disappointment. They've got regret. They've got resentment. They've got anger. Everyone you meet, the fields are ripe into the harvest. Everyone's a mess. Do we slow down enough to see them? The thing is, we just barrel through our life like we're on the interstate at 75 miles an hour. Now, we don't stop because we got to get where we're going. Well, in the movie, Dr. Dad starts off alone. He's angry. He's unsure what he's doing or why. And then he meets the fellow pilgrims. And you've got Yost, who's an overweight Dutchman whose wife is turned off by his weight. He's got no self-esteem left him in at all. You've got an Irish author with writer's block. And then you've got this chick who's been abused by her husband. And so she chose an abortion so her husband wouldn't have two targets to hit. And she's racked with guilt. Everyone is on a journey. Everyone is a sitter at the well. Everyone has a story. They're all around you. Do you see them? Can you notice a theme? A couple of years ago, we were on vacation up in Nova Scotia, and we spent a couple nights at the inn on High Street, and Sue was the innkeeper, and she told us this story. See, in, in order to get people to tell you their story, you've got to ask questions. What's a good question, you say? Let's think real long and hard about this. Let's take a master's level course in psychoanalytics and relationships. Or how about we just say, so Aaron, tell me your story. I've done that with some of you. And then you get something back and you begin to learn about the other person. I had done that with Sue. Tell me your story. How do you end up here in the middle of God's nowhere, running a bed and breakfast? Well, sometimes you get nothing. That's okay. And sometimes you get more than you ever bargained for. Her son had died several years ago. Not long after that, a cat showed up at the house and she was convinced my son sent me that cat. And now she prays to the son. And I don't think she's alone. There's a lot of people. See, people are spiritual. People are not anti-spiritual. The truth part of it, they have difficulty, but we can help them get there. But people are spiritual. She prays to the sun. She acknowledges the reality of the spiritual world like the woman at the well, but she's utterly directionless. She needs truth. Jesus said they're like sheep without a shepherd. 
Your job is to come along the people that God has planted in your field and gently, lovingly shepherd them to the good shepherd. And every day you bump into people just like her, hurting, confused, thirsty, searching, grabbing onto any shred of spirituality or religion they can find that provides them with some shred of hope. A story is filled with them. Wiccan, all sorts of weird religions. Just go underneath sometime and look at some of the stores under our streets. Like, whoa, people really believe this stuff? Like Dolores. Dolores Casey approached us in the parking lot up in Nova Scotia. She's looking for a match. This old lady looking for a match. And what did I say? You asked me for a match, what am I going to say? I haven't had a match since Superman died. Ha! Never heard that one, did you? She burst out laughing. She thought that was hysterical. She wanted to take me home. She didn't smoke. But her husband of 45 years had recently died, and... A nurse told her it would help with the stress. That picture's on my iWatch, by the way. iWatch, you can put 24 pictures on there, and every time you raise your wrist, you, you get a different... There's Julia right there. Remember Julia? When I was asked, when I interviewed two and a half years ago, if I was a compassionate man, I told the girl... I told the story about the girl on my bus whose dad had died. That's, she's right there. My prayer for Dolores Casey was that she would bump into an alive follower of Jesus who would lead her to the source of ultimate comfort. And then I Googled her because I was doing this message and I found out this week Dolores died three years ago. She'd been a nun and finally felt released from that call, married, the husband of 45 years. She had 32 Grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She had two kids of her own, and she adopted seven. Oh, I wish we didn't have to jump in the car and get going to the next place. I would have loved to hear the rest of her story. It pains me that I had to read it in an obituary. But they're out there. Do you see them? I hope that when you leave here today and one of the legacies of my ministry will be that you will just get in the habit of going to restaurants and workplaces and just help each other. Now, elbow the other person. You see that person? I wonder what their story is. And then, by golly, have the guts to go ask them. See what happens. What's the worst they can say? Get away from me, you weirdo. Okay. Like Jasmine, a couple months ago, went to lunch with Elaine Keeley. She used to be a member here. Now she's down at Lighthouse Church, so she's still a member here. Took us out to lunch at the Bridgewater Bistro, and as the food came, we joined hands around the table, and, and we just said a simple prayer, thanking God for this food. Our server was Jasmine. She comes over. She says, I just want to let you guys know that when I saw you praying, it took me back to my childhood and it felt really good. I said, ooh, I'm going to tuck that one away. So as she visited the table for buns or water or refill or whatever else it was, I thought, let's just keep this conversation going. So how were you raised? What, is it, was this a tradition you had in your family? What, what about our doing it triggered it for you? She goes, oh, I was raised in a Christian home. I was homeschooled, and prayer was a huge part of my family's life. So, oh, interesting. Okay, good. And she came back again for dessert or something, and I kept the, con the conversation going. She shared that uh, she had gone to a Calvary Chapel Bible college. Interesting. And then the preacher in me showed up. That's always fun. I thought, okay, I only have one kick at the can. I said, Jasmine, where's your faith life now? You indicated it was in the past, but you're here in Astoria. You have no relatives, no family. You're serving 
at the Bridgewater Bistro, what, what's your relationship with God now? How is that expressed? And oh, the look said it all. Kind of like busted. Probably like the woman at the well. Oh, crap, what do I say to this? <laughs> Choice time. She says, you know, I've, I've, gotten, I've gotten pretty far away from it. I said, I said, Jasmine, I'm a preacher. I said, my job right now, and I don't often pull rank, but I'm telling you, I am the voice of God telling you to get back to what you know is right and true and build your life on the gospel of Jesus Christ and stop messing around. And she didn't call me a weirdo and she didn't spill a tray of food on me. She said, thanks, I needed to hear that. I have prayed for my own daughters that someone would speak that into their lives at various points in their lives. The next Sunday, she was here. And now, she went through training at Alaska Airlines. We're friends on Facebook, as she is with Kim. And she's traveling all over the world. And my prayer is that she will return to her faith it will become significant and meaningful to her, and she will have ministry opportunities all over the world. Joni gets this. I love that she hit me here a couple, couple months ago. Joni Osborne, now over there running around Amsterdam and going to all sorts of car races. She hit me in the back door one Sunday, and she goes, Jim, I just got to tell you the story. I was at Safeway, and I was getting gas. I asked the gas attendant how he was doing, which can be a very dangerous question if they answer it honestly. And he poured out this tale of woe. He sensed that in her she wanted to hear. There was a compassionate ear. And she says, the most amazing thing happened. I found myself, and this isn't me, she said. She said, can I pray with you? And she put her, reached way up, put her arm on his shoulder and prayed a simple prayer that he would find direction and comfort from God, whatever the situation was. So now guess who she's looking for every time she gasses up her red Kia Soul? She's looking for that guy. That's how easy this is. It, you don't have to add anything extra to your day to grow the church, to make a difference. You just have to be attentive to the people that God has placed all around you. These people are what church is all about, like, like, like Libby. <laughs> Ran a video store back in the day when you had to buy videos and stick them in a machine, or actually the round DVD, actually she was both. Her dad owned the store, she ran it, she was a former alcoholic. Far from God. Life was a mess. She had hepatitis from all the stuff she'd been involved with years earlier. Health-wise, a mess. We would go there because she was right around the corner and rent the videos from her. And One day, Kim had to return one or two because they had stuff in there that was just not appropriate, we felt, for our Christian family to be watching. And so she got to explain. Libby's like, well, why, is it, why don't you want to watch this? So Kim got to explain were followers of Jesus and, and invited her to church and lo and behold, she came to church. I told you about Tina Lynn, same thing happened. She was well loved before you know it. She's a follower of Jesus, she confesses Jesus, she's baptized into Christ and she's there every Sunday even to this very day, she's still there. She has a joyous enthusiasm, she greets people at the door, she's incredible. And the first time we had a prayer meeting and she came to pray. And for weeks she would, she would sit there in this chair and we would, we would pray for each other and, and she would say, I'm, I'm too embarrassed, I'm too shy to pray, so I, I'm just gonna pray silently and when I'm done I'll say amen. We said, okay, we're cool with that. And a couple weeks went by and one night we heard, dear God, like, oh. She prayed out loud. And it wasn't long after that we couldn't shut her up. She loves to pray. She's just a natural at it. These people are what church 
is all about. And what set Jesus apart from any other teacher was he listened to their stories. Jesus didn't just go around and teach and pump out words. He was tuned in to where people were coming from. And if we do the same, I'm telling you, we're going to get the same effect. People far from God suddenly realizing God is all they've ever needed. That's our message. You don't need Jim Doerr. He's awesome. He's amazing. He's got a really great wife. You don't need me. You need God. And they just needed a catalyst, a Christ follower who cared enough to listen. So the woman at the well, did you notice where she wasn't? She wasn't at the temple. She wasn't at the synagogue. She wasn't where the religious people hang out. She wasn't at a Bible study. She wasn't at church. Evangelism, and I've said this over and over, is not in here. Boom, it's out there. Your growth, and I said this two and a half years ago, is not by one minister doing it all, but by dozens of disciples in the marketplace where no minister could ever possibly be, in the office, in the plant, in the classroom, stocking shelves at Safeway or Freddie Myers or the co-op, out on the water, in the car dealership, in the Coast Guard, in the school, in the retail store or the restaurant, or waiting for lunch at your favorite food truck, in the line at the grocery store, asking the clerk how her day has been, noticing, asking, listening, praying, caring. That's how this church will grow and that's what I love about Lighthouse coming on board is that's Daniel's vision and man you catch that this place is going to take off like a rocket rubbing shoulders and sensing needs and initiating conversations with spiritually thirsty people this is your opportunity church This is your privilege. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, it was he who gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The purpose of church leadership is not to do the ministry, but to prepare the people of God for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And the church that gives you a ministry and expects you to do it That's what I want to look for in a church. I want a church that's going to ask me and expect me to be about the mission of Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about whether I like the building. It's not even about whether I like the music. It's the mission of Jesus being accomplished. In John chapter 4, the disciples returned from grocery shopping. They never saw the sitter at the well. To them, she wasn't worth a second look, much less a conversation. It never crossed their mind that she was someone thirsty for living water. And they say, Jesus, we've got food. Aren't you hungry? He says, no, I'm not hungry. And they're surprised. And they wonder, well, who fed him while we were gone? And what they failed to realize was that relation, or the conversations like the one he just had were immensely satisfying to him. He tells them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. And you can just see the woman bringing all the Samaritans up the hill. Jesus says, how can I be hungry? There are people who are coming to me. And my challenge to you two and a half years ago, my challenge today, when I come back and guest preach for you in a couple years or months or whenever that is, is going to be the same. It will never change. Open your eyes. Look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Do you see the sitters at the well? Sidewalk prophets have a really cool song called Save My Life, and it expresses exactly what I'm talking about. I thought I would sing it for you this morning. Let me share with you some of the words. We've met half a dozen times. I know your name. I know you don't know mine. But I won't hold that against you. You come here every Friday night. I take your order and try to be polite and hide what I've been going through. If you looked me right in the eye, would you see the pain deep inside? Would you take the time to tell me what I need to hear? Tell me that I'm not forgotten? Show me there's a God who can be much more than all I've ever wanted? Because right now I need a little hope. I need to know that I'm not alone. Maybe God is calling you tonight to tell me something that might save my life. 
That's what you get to do, church. You get to be God's agent in changing and saving people's lives. Remember my bus driver friend, Margaret. She moved out from her boyfriend. She moved into her own place. She was excited to see what future God has for her as she makes decisions that she knows honors him, however difficult they may be. I contacted yesterday a friend of mine who's a bus driver we're friends with on Facebook. I lost contact with Margaret. But she found her on Facebook and sent me the link. So I've got a Facebook request in. She had quit her job as a bus driver and she'd married this guy and she moved away. I'm hoping that Margaret accepts my request and what am I going to ask her? Pretty much what I asked Jasmine. I'm going to say, remember that conversation we had? And maybe she had it with me because she knew I was leaving. I don't know. You know, sometimes we do that. But I'm going to ask her how her walk with God is. It's a story. Stories progress, and we don't always know the ending. Remember my friend Libby? Found out this week she's got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stage four. Then she wrote the sweetest little note to our, my former secretary who shared it with us. So I immediately sent her a note on Messenger and said, how are you doing? I'm sorry to hear that you got to fight this battle now. How can I pray for you? And you know what she wrote back? Why are you so somber? <laughs> and she said, I feel so good. The doctors say I don't have to go through chemo. It's not necessarily a death sentence anyway. People die at stage two. She said, so I'm grateful to God that I don't have to go through the pain. And I get to be around for my parents until God calls me home. And I thought, wow. We did that, church. We loved someone, accepted them, taught them truth, gave them hope, helped them deal with their sin problem like Tim talked about in his communion meditation. And now as she faces this monster of a health issue. She's okay with God and she's happy that she doesn't have to lose her hair and go through the nausea. This is what it's all about. This is what church is all about. We get to give people hope that takes them through the grave. And there are some stories going on right here, right now. And that means everything to you. Don't let church become anything less than that. So let's have an invitation. Maybe like the woman at the well or Sue the innkeeper or the match seeking Dolores, you've got a major hurt somewhere in your life and you just have a sense maybe this Jesus business could be what you're looking for. Let me encourage you, talk to some of us. I'm out of here. You can't talk to me anymore, but you can text me and I'll talk to you all you want. I will. Or maybe like Rosaria Butterfield or Tina Lynn or Libby, the kindness of a Christ follower has made you aware of the living water that Jesus offers. And I would just ask you, come now, keep that relationship moving forward. Choose to place your trust in Jesus. Obey him in the waters of baptism and let him begin the transformation work that God wants to do in your life. What does God want to do in your life? He wants you to come to Jesus Christ and then grow in him and then figure out how you can do that again in someone else's life. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. Or maybe like the disciples, you've been blind to the well-suiters all around you. And I would just pray that God would open your eyes to the opportunities and the possibilities everywhere to give you Jesus' heart for the people far from God. When I announced my resignation a couple of months ago, Tim stood here and enthusiastically announced that my ministry was not over. <laughs> and he was right. My ministry continues through you seeing the sitters at the well. All around you. See them.
see them. For God's sake. For heaven's sake. See them.